Hello friends. So we've just done some great work to get ourselves centered, to get to know each other, and to create a covenant that is going to guide us as we engage in some really important and perhaps challenging material throughout this course. So thank you for showing up. And now that you have shown up and done this great work, let's get into it. This video is going to walk us through some of the basics of grief. What is it? How it behaves? Some of the symptoms and causes of grief and ways it might show up in our lives. We'll basically be trying to answer the question, what is grief? How do we see it show up in our lives and in our world? Because before we can find solutions for grief or learn to work through grief or grow through grief, we need to understand what it is and what it's not. Grief, simply put, is a response to loss. We often think of grief as an emotion, and it can be. It can be marked by feelings of sadness, distress, and longing, but grief can also be physical. It is experienced somatically or in the body. Common symptoms of grief include numbness, which could show up as either emotional feeling or a lack of physical sensation even. Symptoms also include loneliness, emptiness, isolation, and not just the feeling of isolation, but the actual reality of it. Because a lot of people who are in grief experience isolation from their community or friends or family members who don't know how to show up for them, don't know how to engage with them. So the feeling of isolation is often confirmed in a person's experience that their community cannot actually show up for them. Grief can also include feelings of dread, fear, anxiety, a loss of memory, disorientation, loss of a sense of time or one's place in a timeline. Grief is often accompanied by feelings of guilt or a sense that one was responsible for the loss or shame for needing help. And as I said, grief can also be intensely and even primarily physical. Headaches, body pain, stomach pain, exhaustion, depression, sleeplessness are all often physical symptoms of grief. Sometimes when a person is experiencing somatic symptoms of grief, they're not even consciously aware that this is grief that they're experiencing. It's easy to write off these kinds of symptoms as just being tired or just having headaches all the time. But it's important to nuance here that just because you've experienced some of the symptoms that I've just listed does not necessarily mean that it's grief. There's lots of causes for headaches, guilt, or fear. But all of these can be indicators of a deeper grief. Grief is like the ultimate master of disguise which shows up in our lives as rage, anger, anxiety, or even physical pain, might actually be grief, disguising itself so that it can be expressed. Since we as humans are notoriously uncomfortable and sometimes even unable to express the truth of our grief, it finds all kinds of ways to show up in our lives. Just as an example, and a little thought experiment, think about a time that you were furiously angry. One comes to my mind pretty quickly, but I wanna ask you to consider what was under that anger? Perhaps it could have been a loss of trust in a person or in an institution or the absence of fairness. Under that anger could be a loss of safety or a threat of danger to someone that you love, the loss of an opportunity, a loss of a sense that we are respected or valued, a sense of injustice or some kind of injury. Think on it because it might be that under that anger is a wound, a pain or a deep grief. Grief will always find a way to be expressed. And unfortunately, grief does not behave itself. 
and does not stick to a schedule or enter itself into your calendar. In the TV show Succession, after, after the loss of her father, one of the characters, who is a high-powered New York City executive, schedules 15-minute crying breaks into her busy calendar. But of course, the walls of a conference room or the bounds of a 15-minute scheduled cry break cannot contain her grief. Although she thinks she's hiding it, her grief shows up in all kinds of ways, always. Grief pops up, sometimes when you least expect it or least want it to. A dear friend of mine always says that grief is elastic. Some days it is intense and ever-present and unavoidable, and others it is gentle or numbing or pointed or dull. A great question to ask someone experiencing grief is what does your grief look like today? Because the experience of grief moves from day to day. It shifts, it changes, and we are not in charge of this shift and this change. Often unexpected things can trigger grief. The realization that you won't be able to tell that person Happy Father's Day again. Life milestones, places, smells, even songs, different activities, all of these things can trigger grief unexpectedly, even many, many years after a loss. Grief is human. It is not a disease. It is not an indication that something is wrong with you. Grief is part of being human. There is a recent movement to add prolonged and intense grief to the DSM, the Clinical Manual for Mental Disorders. Many clinicians think this is wrong because prolonged and even extraordinary grief is common and human. It is natural and indeed even rational response to extreme loss. Prolonged or lifelong grief after the death of a loved one is normal. Prolonged grief after the experience of a traumatic event is normal. Prolonged or lifelong grief after the loss of a hoped for future is normal. And unfortunately, occasions for extreme grief are growing. As the climate crisis worsens and natural disasters bring mass destruction to communities all over the world, as gun access remains unchecked in some countries and mass shootings become a daily occurrence, as wars and immigration crises separate individuals from their family and communities from their land and their homes, we have more reasons than ever to experience prolonged and intense grief. And we all are exposed to more grief and more occasions for grief than ever before. We're not limited to only the suffering of our families or our immediate communities anymore, but we hear and see loss and trauma and grief that's happening all over the world, all the time, in real time. But I don't want you to get the impression that loss has to look like a mass traumatic event or like this kind of systemic loss to be legitimate. There are many kinds of loss. We can suffer material loss. This can look like the loss of a home or a precious object or material goods that we depend on. Matter matters and its loss is an occasion for grief. We can also suffer the loss of a place or a sense of place. Indigenous people who have lost their land or a person who's moving into a retirement home after living in the same home their whole life, all suffer a loss of place. We can suffer also the loss of relationships through divorce or a breakup or a move or an ended friendship. We often lose relationships even with people we love when we decide to set boundaries with family members or relatives who have harmed us. We can suffer a loss of a sense of ourselves. Perhaps you've had a dream that died or 
a goal you were striving for that fell through and shattered your sense of the kind of person you thought you were. We can suffer the loss of ability due to age, injury, disability, or fatigue. Disability activists sometimes say that we are only ever temporarily able-bodied. All of us will experience a loss of ability if we live long enough. We can suffer the loss of a role we once had. This often happens as people retire or their kids move out of the house and they become empty nesters. We can experience the loss of possible futures. Marriage is a loss like this, actually, because in choosing that one person, you're experiencing a loss of all the possible futures you might have had with other people. And though it's an occasion for rejoicing, it might also be an occasion for grief. Buying a house or settling into a long career can be a loss like this too. We can also, of course, experience systemic loss. This is the sort of large scale loss like what happened to the whole world in the pandemic. We all suffered in the pandemic. War is a systemic loss. Ecological destruction is a systemic loss. The grief over the environment, that the world will never be what it once was again, will impact all of us. And this is a tremendous loss that I think we're only just beginning to take seriously. There is also grief that is born of injustice. The kind of loss that is ongoing and communal, like racism, sexism, and all forms of discrimination. These are all forms of loss. And you can see, I hope, the ways that loss and grief exist personally and communally in very individualized ways and on even a global scale. And all of these types of loss are legitimate and can produce grief. Grief is a natural and human response to loss. Grief in this sense is holy and maybe even good. Not because it's good that people suffer, but because grief is really the only sensible response to a world that is so broken. Grief is a sign of our humanity, of our interconnectedness, of our compassion, and our great capacity for love. In our grief, we reflect God. God shares in our grief and experiences grief for us and with us. But none of this minimizes the reality of grief. Grief is real and persistent and deeply painful. But what I want you to hear is that your grief is not beyond the reach of God. It is not something you have to hide from God or fix before you can be a part of Christian community. Your grief is welcome here. So I want to leave you with this final question for your consideration. Where have you seen grief this week? As we have heard, grief comes in all forms and shows up all around us. So just take a time to reflect and write down a few ways you've seen grief show up either in your personal life or in your community or even in the world. Thank you for being here, friends. And as you go, and as you reflect, and as you, as you walk through this coming week, may God, who gives peace, and God, who gives compassion, go with you. <laughs>